Well, uh, welcome everybody to the uh, American Thoracic Society's COVID-19 Critical Care Training Forum, which is a weekly uh, offering that we've developed over the last uh, 10 to 12 weeks. Uh, it happens every Tuesday, 8 p.m. We start, we usually try to end by 9 p.m. Uh, the discussions get spirited sometimes and go on till 9.30. Uh, our goal with this forum is to bring trainees and experts together to share their experiences with various aspects of COVID-19. Uh, and today, we will be talking about uh, medical education in uh, COVID-19. Just uh, to share, the last uh, session from last Tuesday, which is June 16th, is now uh, recorded and available to watch. Uh, an easy way to find it is to Google ATS COVID-19 forum. And uh, the moderator was Dr. Bojnowski, and it was a very, very, it was probably one of the most moving talks I've heard, uh, especially with uh, Dr. Beetler discussing how uh, they developed the ventilator sharing uh, model at uh, Columbia and uh, the whole process behind it. Today, uh, I'm very lucky, inspired, and uh, excited to bring to you four um, experts, uh, one, uh, one of our fellows and three other experts from the field of medical education. Um, so I'll introduce them one by one, so please give them a warm welcome. Uh, Dr. Shah is a pulmonary critical care fellow at uh, Upstate Medical University. He has been integrally involved with the epidemiology process here during the pandemic, has had interesting insights uh, regarding how education has progressed uh, as the pandemic has gone on, and he will share his uh, sort of experience uh, with the um, how the pandemic affected his uh, education. Dr. Hayes uh, is an assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and uh, Beth Rozelle Deaconess, Deaconess um, Medical Center. She's a clerkship director for the ICU clerkships, uh, is the assistant program director of the internal medicine program, and is the director of the nationally coveted and known uh, uh, Harvard Critical Care Medicine for Non-Intensivists uh, uh, CME program. She also is uh, well-published uh, and uh, well-known for her work in medical simulation and procedural training. Also probably one of the kindest educators I know. Uh, Dr. Um, Santosh is currently assistant professor uh, as well as the associate program director uh, at uh, UCSF. She's grant funded um, on a few things. So I'll mention two of them. One is a patient safety project and then uh, trying to understand how uh, you can use design thinking to improve patient safety. And then uh, women in um, lung disease, uh, women in medicine uh, series at UCSF. She has also been instrumental in creating the post uh, uh, sort of discharge recovery of uh, COVID-19 patients program on the outpatient side, which has been uh, uh, then, uh, which has gone on to inspire other programs across the country. And um, Dr. Santosh, uh, Dr. Gandotra uh, is at University of Alabama at Birmingham. She is the uh, assistant uh, program director uh, at the uh, Palmcrete program there. She has published and studies long-term uh, functional outcomes after ICU visits. And uh, where her, her and I gel the most besides uh, me texting her almost every day is um, that we both love airway and uh, simulation training. Uh, and she herself is an international medical graduate, uh, graduate and will be addressing how this pandemic affected them um, uh, as we go on. So um, this is just a, a quick um, thank you to the uh, critical care uh, training working forum, uh, working group, forum working group. Uh, it's been uh, an honor and pleasure to be here every week and thank you all for attending every time. If you have any questions, uh, please again, Google uh, the forum, uh, get there, reach out to us. We would love to uh, know what, what else you wanna hear about uh, going forward. And uh, I would encourage you guys to uh, use this QR code, which I will bring up later as well to give us feedback. It'll take you to a very quick survey. This is what we use to sort of uh, improve our offerings. Uh, so it would be much appreciated if you could uh, just take a moment and fill this survey out. And so with that, I, will, um, I would like to invite Dr. Shah to uh, give us some, uh, share with us how this pandemic uh, impacted education in his eyes. Take it away, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Call. Um, I'm going to just bring up my presentation. All right. So thank you for that introduction. My name is Amish. I'm one of the PGY-5s here at SUNY Upstate. 
uh, Medical University. I'll be starting out my presentation with kind of explaining what our um, training was like prior to the pandemic, what happened during the pandemic. And I know we, we're still in the pandemic, but after the surge, um, what, where we are at, and in my eyes, what the cons and the pros were of the, my medical education during this time. So prior to COVID, um, we would generally have at least three lectures a week. Two are given by fellows, one are given by an attending. And the lectures were various. They included case conferences, imaging conference, M&Ms, um, evidence-based medicine, board review courses. Also, we would have multidisciplinary rounds, including radiology, pathology, infectious disease um, during our home pathology and ILD conferences as well. And these lectures would be met together by three different teaching institutions, uh, one at Upstate, one at Krauss, and also the VA Medical Center. We're all within one block of each other, and we would meet together for these three lectures a week. Um, we have a pretty robust bronchoscopy rotation, which included a cystic fibrosis uh, clinic and also a TOPS clinic while on the bronchoscopy rotation. And we had multiple different electives, such as neuro ICU, surgical ICU, uh, going to echo, radiology, and even uh, cardiac ICU. Um, we would learn about PFTs, read PFTs uh, during our pulmonary rotation. And most importantly, we also took the opportunity during our ICU time to teach procedures to residents, um, more specifically in the ICU, because we do work closely with our residents during um, our ICU rotations. So during the pandemic, um, we decided to cancel lectures for two months, mostly because of the unknown. We did not know how the surge was going to hit. Uh, Syracuse, New York. Uh, we met together in a meeting in March and made a decision to cancel lectures for those two months so we could concentrate on our clinical duties at that time. Uh, per hospital administration, we had to limit the number of bronchoscopies that we were able to perform. And all electives were decided to be canceled at that time to preserve the health of the fellows, to minimize contact with patients who may or may not have COVID and um, so all those electives that I described in my first slide were canceled in order to preserve the health of fellows. Um, the PFT lab closed as it was an aerosolizing procedure. And one of the other things during my medical education is we noticed that the fellows were doing all of the procedures on patients in the COVID units in the ICU, whether that be central lines or arterial lines, putting in chest tubes, whatever may be required, the fellows were doing all the procedures, whereas pre-COVID um, procedures were supervised by fellows, and that's where we did a lot of our teaching uh, regarding procedural skills. Uh, one thing that we did want to do was minimize contact at bedside. So we taught a lot less at bedside and taught more outside of the room. And it was mostly to minimize contact with patients. But in addition to that, it was to minimize the use of PPEs. And that was another thing that occurred during the pandemic is we were far more mindful of the PPEs that we were using, considering the shortages uh, just down the state from us uh, in New York City. So we're very mindful of that, something that, to be honest, we were not as mindful uh, pre-pandemic. Another thing that happened during the pandemic is we created a WhatsApp group between the fellows and attendings uh, throughout all three institutions, which did lead to far better communication, not just within the department, but to talk about different policies that were coming forward, different literature that was coming out. And having this open communication was something that we had never done previously. We were openly discussing the new literature that was coming, whether it be from China, from Italy. Um, and normally the forum to discuss the literature was either at lectures or if you're on rounds, but with technology and how we were using technology a lot more, we did openly discuss more literature as they came out. Usually within 24 hours, there would be a PDF with the literature and we'd openly discuss this literature and how we could utilize it uh, day to day. Um, we, I, I would like to say that we did feel like colleagues with the attendings. Um, pre previously, we would feel like colleagues, but this entire 
pandemic brought us together. We were able to speak freely about our experiences and about the literature, our ideas. Um, and that was not maybe necessarily the case prior to that, but this entire unknown brought that together. And uh, honestly, a lot of literature was read during this due to the huge unknown about the virus. We were spending more time reading, are we doing the right things? I mean, back in March, we were intubating patients at six liters instead of using high flow nasal cannula or BiPAP. And this was something that was just an ongoing review of literature as time went on. We, as I said, we shared a lot more ideas on how to treat these patients. Another thing that occurred is we were having daily updates from our incident command that involved our one of our Palm Crit attendings, the infectious disease doctors, and we were learning on a daily basis, not just from uh, policies that were set forward by CDC or from WHO, but talking even within our own institution, what things we were changing, what we were updating. And this led to great communication between fellows, attendings, and administration. And that led to the last thing is we did learn how to deal with administration in a far closer manner. Um, and that we noticed that having a voice really does matter, which is something that we may not have noticed prior to the pandemic. So currently, we meet on Zoom twice a week for lectures. And for many of us, it's if you're not on a mandatory rotation, it's from the comfort of our, of our homes. And we are opening up the bronchoscopy suite more. There's more hospital normalization. One thing is the fellows are still doing many of the procedures on these COVID patients in the ICU. And the PFT lab is slowly opening up again. So some of the negatives that I saw regarding my medical education during this time, um, during the pandemic is we noticed that we were teaching the residents a lot less at bedside and procedural skills was something we were teaching even less because we were doing most of the procedures. We wanted to minimize the contact that the residents had with patients with COVID, wanted to minimize the amount of PPE being used and therefore the fellows were doing most of the procedures. Uh, we did take a break from our regularly scheduled pulmonary lectures for about two months. So we had less lectures about pulmonary hypertension, COPD, um, in, uh, interstitial lung disease. These were different lectures that we just took a complete break from in order to concentrate on our clinical duties. And the other challenge that we had is that different systems, as I said, we, we rotate at three different teaching institutions. Each institution had different policies and different patterns, and that made it a challenge. For example, one of our institutions, um, and this more from, came from a national standpoint, is residents were not allowed to enter um, rooms that were occupied by patients who had COVID, and they were not taught how to doff on and, on and off PPE, which is something that I do think was possibly even a disservice to some of these residents, because there'll be attendings within a year or two. But this was one of the negatives because we were trying to shield and protect residents and, and fellows and other staff members. We definitely had a lot less procedures in the manner of elective procedures, such as PFTs and Bronx due to um, COVID-19. And one of, the, one of the last negatives is we did learn a lot during the pandemic, but we also realized after that we knew so little, and that was such a humbling experience about the pandemic. Um, some of the pros, and I have a long list here, and I'll try to get through them uh, quickly. Um, one of the pros of the pandemic is we all learned how to use Zoom a lot more efficiently and attending lectures became far more efficient as well. And we learned really how to work during a pandemic. And I think we will be better prepared for that in the future. We first can, at least as a fellow, learn how to deal with these emergency responses. Uh, we learn how to triage, we learn how to update protocols, and we learn how to create surge patterns, which we never had any formal education for that, whether it be in medical school or even residency. So that was a, a, an amazing experience from that standpoint of how do you work within the system to create um, and, and to work through this pandemic. Uh, communication, I don't think has ever been better um, at, at our institution between fellows and attendings. Um, we feel a lot closer to them. We feel that we can have conversations um, whether it be about the pandemic or not about the pandemic, but even talking about literature in a more informal manner instead of just waiting for formal avenues to talk about literature. And I think that that was definitely a pro that came out of the pandemic. Um, we, as fellows at least, um, I can say that we did get a, a lot better at doing procedures in not so comfortable situations, wearing PPEs, whether it be HAPR, wearing multiple gowns, 
double gloving. These are different things that made things far more uncomfortable, but we became more proficient in that. And that's something that um, definitely was a pro during the pandemic. Um, as I stated before, we read more during the pandemic, but more importantly, I think we critically challenged more literature now than ever before. There was a lot of literature coming out, whether it was, um, whether it was premature, whether it, it wasn't the greatest study, but having that ability to challenge literature far more in real time was definitely important. And we learned how to also rely on body of literature from the past, for example, from the SARS epidemic from 10 years ago, or even going back to data regarding, was this really ARDS or is this not ARDS? And actually challenging that literature was uh, very important during the pandemic. Another thing which Dr. Call did bring up a little bit earlier is we took initiatives and avenues that I would not have previously. For example, I worked with our epidemiology team here at Upstate and I had a little bit of background in epidemiology during my master's education, but to actually implement it and use that during the pandemic was something that I would have never guessed doing during fellowship. So you, taking those initiatives was definitely a pro. And in addition to that, took some national initiatives as well, like working on the SECM virus registry, which is something that, again, I don't think that I would have been a part of, you know, had the pandemic not occurred. And as electives were canceled, as I described before, as I said, we definitely had more time to study and read. And one of the other um, more innovative platforms uh, to discuss all of our training and regarding COVID, such as this one right here, this is something that definitely is something that we did not have, you know, six months ago. And another, another thing that was unprecedented was talking to leaders in China and Italy on a weekly basis, sometimes even a daily basis when we hit the surge and understanding what their experience was and implementing that for our own, at our own hospital was something that was completely unprecedented and definitely helped our medical education and helped our patients as well. And so those are, some of the pros and cons and how I felt my medical education was impacted during the pandemic. And I wanted to thank, thank you all again for listening for what my experience was. Thank you, Amish. I, first of all, I want to thank you and all the trainees uh, across the country and the globe for really standing up, showing up. And this was, these were hard times. They were scary times. They were scary times for me. Um, so, and, and I, I, I saw everybody show up every morning, head held high, ready to do what needed to be done, and then uh, trying to make the next day better. Uh, there, there's some comments uh, where people are sharing about how these early training sessions, um, early teaching sessions initially uh, turned out to be uh, avenues to share anxieties or to address concerns. And I think that was all of our experiences as well. Um, so thank you for sharing that, Amish. Uh, Dr. Hayes, um, if you'd like to pull up your presentation, you'd love to uh, hear more about how the pandemic changed uh, training. Great, thank you all. Um, thanks so much, Viren, for having me. I'm excited to uh, see a lot of familiar faces and to sort of connect with everyone. I'm sure like a lot of you, it feels like the last couple months we've just like been in the trenches. So it's nice to sort of take a step back and reflect a little bit. So I have no disclosures. Um, the goals that I have for the next 10 or 15 minutes are to really define the scope of the problem and then characterize our specific problems. And I want to use my hospital, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, as a case study, as I know that everyone surged a little bit differently. But I think you'll hear a lot of common themes um, from the last presentation and this presentation and probably throughout. And hopefully um, this will sort of engender rich discussion amongst us all. And then I'd love to discuss um, some strategies <laughs> to mitigate the problems we caused and to minimize disruption to training in the future. So as everyone on this Zoom knows, every learner was impacted by COVID-19. So for us, our students, our Harvard Medical School students, they had no more in-person sessions. There was decreased peer-to-peer -peer learning and socialization. Most of their curriculum is this case-based collaborative learning. You can see in this picture here, many of you may recognize Dr. Schwartzstein standing up there teaching. There was also disruption in clerkships and sub-internships, which led to decrease in clinical skills and had implications for the upcoming match. So the resident was also impacted. For us, we pulled residents from electives to work in the ICUs. They had decreased opportunities to perform procedures. We heard a little bit about that in the last talk. 
Um, we early on were minimizing providers in COVID rooms and we had issues with PPE early on as well. There were missed learning opportunities, of course, due to COVID-19. Um, one of the biggest that I joke about is that there's a whole sort of crop of interns that have no idea what high flow nasal cannula is because early on we were not using it. And it was sort of actually like thought to be the devil and like people wouldn't even mention it. And same for non-invasive ventilation. Now we're a little bit better with high flow nasal cannula, but we still don't use non-invasive as much as we did pre-COVID. Our pulmonary fellows also were impacted. They had early graduations and credentialing as attendings and sort of just uh, thrust into attending hood. There was missed research time, missed pulmonary time, missed non-COVID critical care time, and they had to learn telehealth on the fly. For us, we use medicine fellows, so endocrine fellows, rheumatology fellows, GI fellows, cardiology fellows, to staff our ICUs. So this really impacted them, and I'm gonna spend a little bit more time talking about this, but they also had missed opportunities in their specialty, missed telehealth visits, Many of these subspecialty medicine fellows are primarily outpatient um, subspecialists, so they really had a lot of missed opportunities. There was missed research opportunities, and they were forced to perform more of the scut work as they functioned sort of as residents and interns in our surge units and in some of the other rotations where they were pulled. So when we look sort of at our surge plan and how our training paradigm shifted, I think it mostly impacted our subspecialty medicine fellows, so actually not the pulmonary fellows, but the other fellows, and our residents and interns. I'm going to tell you a little bit about why that is um, based on our surge plan. So this is our uh, building on our West Campus, and what we did was basically take over this whole seventh floor of the Rosenberg building. On that floor, we have traditional ICUs, but there's also a large medicine floor that has 32 beds. What we did was sort of create um, pods on that floor. So each pod had eight patients, and there was one pulmonary and critical care attending or taking care of the eight patients. There was a medicine fellow, again, an endocrine, rheumatology, GI fellow, or a medicine resident, and then a medicine intern. And they functioned as a team and would care for eight to sometimes nine patients. So, to staff this, what we did was pull interns and residents, and we actually pulled them mostly from the inpatient cardiology unit to work in these pods. And then what we did was had the cardiology fellows staff the inpatient cardiology unit. We pulled medicine fellows, as I mentioned already, GI endocrine geriatrics to work in the pods. And then we pulled residents from electives to also cover these pods. So what are the learner implications due to this staffing? Well, for the fellow, I think they really miss that 20,000 foot view learning opportunities. The, the way that they can learn sort of be by taking a step back and looking up the literature or sort of functioning as an attending, they were forced to do intern work, especially our cardiology fellows. They were sort of staffing their cardiology floors and doing discharge summaries, doing all the orders. They had missed telehealth visits, missed procedural learning. So our GI fellows that were pulled to cover our surge ICUs, they especially um, complained about missing scopes. So during COVID in general, scoping was much less, but the few opportunities that they may have had to scope, they actually missed because they were covering the ICU. And there was obviously a lot of lost research time. Many uh, research sort of functions were shut down at our hospital, as I'm sure most uh, were across the country. Um, but some of the fellows said that, you know, they had papers to write or they were able to sort of crunch data at home and they lost those opportunities to do that. For our residents, they had missed elective time. So this was problematic for fellowship planning and for applications. We've had a few residents actually tell us that because of this, they want to sort of extend and take an extra year. And maybe pre-COVID, like January, February, March, they weren't thinking about that. They wanted to sort of go right through but they missed these crucial electives sort of in this springtime junior into senior year where they could ask for letter writers. There was missed inpatient cardiology time. This is a huge problem as the majority of our residents who um, go into fellowships do go into cardiology. So this was a huge issue. There are some positives though. I actually had um, my friend and colleague who many of you know, Morgan Soffler, um, look at these slides and give me feedback. And she said, you should talk about some of the positives and some of the things that we learned. So the residents had tons of ICU time. And for the pulmonary critical care interested residents, um, they loved that and they really felt like they learned a lot. For our interns, they had some of the same issues as our residents. They had missed elective time. They had missed inpatient cardiology time. But the positive was that they had a incredible autonomy in the ICU. So one of our uh, res interns said that working in the pods was 
the best experience of all of his intern year because he felt like he was really leading the team. He was working with a geriatrics and a rheumatology fellow, and he really felt like he got one-on-one -on -one learning from them in their subspecialty and also sort of one-on-one -on -one learning from the attending. We um, purposely made a decision early on to have like pretty good staffing ratios. It wasn't in our initial surge plan, but then we found that we actually had more intensivists than we had other sort of members to staff the ICU. So we kept our ratios pretty low so everyone felt um, that they could sort of manage the workload and that they could still do some teaching, at least on the fly, if some of the didactics were canceled. And there are some great stories that we heard. Um, a patient went into AFib with RVR and there was a cardiology fellow that happened to be on, was sort of coaching the intern through it and making sure the intern sent a TSH. Then the next day the endocrine fellow was on and sort of coaching the intern about the problems of sending TSH in the ICU. So it was a really unique um, experience and opportunity that our interns loved and our attendings actually really enjoyed as well. So there are a lot of learner implications due to COVID-19, um, which we heard a little bit about in the previous talk, but for the fellows, there was lost time in their chosen specialty, lost research time, they had to function as an intern again. Um, many missed out on the proper end to fellowship. Um, I think all the program directors across the country, especially in pulmonary and critical care, did a phenomenal job with Zoom graduations and social distancing parties, and I enjoyed seeing everything on Twitter and Facebook. Um, but I know that this was bittersweet, and it was hard for not only the fellows, but also for the program directors. For the residents, there was missed elective learning opportunities, missed opportunities I mentioned in interactions for letter writers, which actually is becoming a huge problem and then lost um, in-person didactics. We have firm conferences every Friday where we sort of have one of these master clinicians come in and do a lot of hands-on teaching, and obviously um, that had to be changed to more virtual. We also do a lot of procedural half days, which we had to change as well. And then they also missed out on sort of proper ending to their residencies. For the interns, missed elective learning opportunities, lost didactics. Um, lost procedural opportunities. This is actually um, becoming a big problem. Um, many of our interns, um, we have three ICUs that we staff at BI, so many of them have a lot of ICU time sort of from the winter to uh, June, and they sort of missed out on the opportunities that they would have normally had to do central lines or paracentesis or thoracentesis um, because we were minimizing people in the room. We were trying to like, not use up PPE. So oftentimes these Procedures were done either by our pulmonary fellows acting as attendings or by uh, attendings themselves. And then lost learning opportunities. I mentioned already um, a little bit tongue in cheek, but there is some truth to it. The high flow nasal cannula, non-invasive ventilation. We, I think like many places across the country had very sort of unique sedation practices. Um, felt like every other day we were running out of something and how to replace it with something else. Um, so I do worry that there may be a lot of people out there who think it's normal to be on phenobarb and ketamine and a fentanyl patch and get um, Valium enterally. So that was a challenge for us. And then there was a lot of lost opportunities for sort of basic critical care. When we started teaching again, everyone said like, please don't tell us about ARDS. Like we wanna talk about shock. We wanna talk about cardiology critical care and GI critical care. Um, so there was a lot of those missed opportunities. So what are our fixes and how did this change our paradigm? So many of our fixes are sort of in anticipation of our next surge in the fall. So what we learned was that we really wanna minimize the fellow pulls if and when we surge again. If we use these sort of subspecialty medicine fellows, we want to try to avoid people who were pulled already and had lost time. Um, luckily, our GME office was keeping track of everything and trying to sort of um, divvy it up fairly amongst the different um, divisions and subspecialties. But that was a big um, problem, and I do worry about that uh, for the fall. For our residents, uh, you know, we really enhanced our virtual didactics and now have our firm conferences virtually. Um, we're working hard from a residency leadership perspective to really accommodate everyone's schedule changes to get the electives that they missed um, during the pandemic. And um, we really want to avoid pulling from electives again. So we actually are working on sort of a extra sort of jeopardy pool where you get pulled from if we surge, but it wouldn't cut into your elective time. And then we're rearranging schedules to make up um, inpatient cardiology time, especially for these residents who are interested in cardiology so that they can focus on sort of getting letter writers and making connections. For our interns, sort of same enhanced virtual didactics, we're working on increased procedural opportunities. 
Um, something that we've done at BI is do these nighttime central line trainings. We call them central line and cheese. So we have cheese and um, like sparkling apple cider and try to make sort of a non-threatening, very low-key environment, make it fun and let people come and practice central lines. So we are thinking that we may have to put on one of these weekly um, for the next couple months so that we can get the interns sort of up to speed and not just on central lines on other procedures that they may have missed as well. And then uh, we are focused now on um, sort of non-COVID, non-ARDS teaching on the ICU blocks and talking about sort of separating out the residents and the interns for our teaching, which is not something that we had done in the past, but did during COVID to socially distance. Um, and that way we can focus on sort of this non-COVID teaching for our juniors and seniors. So there is still a ton to learn. Um, I think I have more sort of questions and I brought up more problems than I have answers to how this changed, um, how we teach and how our learners learn. But I know that it has and I think we're all learning a lot. We're still in the process of debriefing. I think we sort of feel like we just came out of the surge and are preparing for another one. Um, so we're in the process of really debriefing. And what we're trying to do from an education perspective is really debrief in the context of Bloom's taxonomy so we can think about what we did. It may sound silly, but I had a hard time even remembering what we did like end of March, beginning of April, because so much of it feels like a blur. How it impacted learners in the short term and then in the long term. I think some of this we're still going to be figuring it out, how it affected them. Um, we know that there are definitely um, implications for our residents applying into fellowships and for our students applying to residencies as well. And then how can we do it better next time? So we sort of are all geared up here in Boston for another surge in the fall and are in the process of creating surge plans that, like I mentioned on previous slides, don't include the fellows who were pulled before, don't include um, pulling from elective time for our residents. So those are some of the changes sort of that we made and that we're gonna make going forward. And I think things are going to continue to change. So thank you very much for listening to me. I'm happy to take questions and looking forward to a rich discussion at the end of this. Thank you, Dr. Hayes. And I, I agree with you. What stood out is that while we were uh, learning so much, at the same time, we were trying to you know, reimagine the traditional learning models because they all got challenged, right, from bedside teaching and all the way to how we interact across specialties. And mm -hmm. uh, so, yes, yeah, so there is, has been a lot to learn. There is a very robust discussion uh, going on in the chat. So please continue that. Uh, Dr. Santosh, if you don't mind, um, uh, while you prepare to share your screen and, uh, you know, share tips on how to interview both for uh, interviewees as well as uh, faculty who will be interviewing. This has been... Uh, a very hotly debated, discussed topic, um, mainly because we've never done this before. Um, I've had a very short career. I definitely don't remember um, uh, something like this coming up. Uh, now, I do want to, um, as before we go into this, if you uh, don't mind sharing your experiences, uh, as I see a lot of educators in the uh, participants list and a lot of trainees. So if you guys have any concerns or you want to ask Dr. Santosh something, just feel free to just uh, type it out in the chat. All right, Dr. Santosh, all yours. Thank you so much. And yes, absolutely. We want to keep this interactive. I would love to hear your questions as they come up. As Varun said, I'm Lakshmi Sandosh. I'm going to present our top tips for interviewing for both applicants and educators. And I don't have any disclosures either. So. What has been clear is that now several organizations have actually declared that the best practice to do is actually to go all in on virtual interviews. And so some organizations that have declared that, the AIM, which is the Alliance for Academ Academic Internal Medicine, so they recommended all in virtual interviews for both residencies and fellowships across the subspecialties. Our own APCCMPD, the American Program Directors Association for Palm Critical Care, and at AAMC, American Association of Medical Colleges. So all of these have recommended all in virtual interviews. And what that means is that they don't recommend a hybrid approach of in-person and virtual interviews. They say really to maintain equity and fairness, everyone, even if you're interviewing locally at the hospital just up the hill, as in my case, they recommend that interviewees, applicants take these interviews virtually so that it doesn't create sort of 
unconscious bias or an unequal playing ground for applicants from different institutions. And we'll talk more about unconscious bias later on in the session because I think that is really important to think about in this context. So I would love to hear a quick show of hands if you can use the show hands function in the chat box. How many of you have ever been interviewed via Zoom before for, for like a job, not just a Zoom, Zoom meeting as we're doing right now, but how many people have actually done a, an actual Zoom interview for a job before? Okay, interesting. I'm seeing a couple of hands pop up. Don't have a way to quantify it quite yet. Some, some thumbs up, but I think the vast majority of you have not. And then I'm going to ask the opposite question. How many of you have interviewed somebody for a job or for a position, been in the interviewer chair virtually? Raise your hand. Okay, a little bit more uptake on this one. So that is really interesting. Thank you for participating in our quick poll there. And so this is just gonna be a 10 minute quick hits, really practical. And if you wanna hear more, the APCC MPD actually has some great resources. They put out this webinar called Pearls and Pitfalls of Virtual Interviewing with some of our finest educators here. And so they have this webinar that's a one hour webinar that's recorded available on the APCC MPD. And similarly, there's a great podcast from another stellar group of educators also about virtual interviews. If you're more of an audio listener rather than a visual listener, and if you wanna delve more into this topic. So let's dive right in. So just a quick you know, rundown of the pros and cons of virtual interviews. Really, the pros saves money for everybody. You get to sleep in your own bed. That actually says a lot. It is green, good for the environment. You don't spread COVID-19 over the country and contribute to a second or third surge. That's a good thing. And you have the ability to check out more programs. The cons are, of course, the dreaded technical difficulties, Zoom fatigue, which all of us are experiencing with headaches, fatigue, blurry vision, et cetera. Um, you can't explore the city, actually, and you just get a view through this little computer screen. There's also fewer opportunities to kind of informally interact with fellows, meet faculty, those hallway opportunities, those side chats, those water cooler conversations. And another con is you might feel that you need to check out more programs because you're unable to make these assessments of what's a good fit. Do you see something in common between these pro and con lists? What I see is that applicants, interviewers, and program directors all essentially are sharing those exact same pros and cons. Interviewers are also happy that they don't have that they get to sleep in their own bed and don't have to, you know, go through a lot of extra effort to interview multiple candidates. Everyone is happy that people are not traveling around the country spreading COVID-19. So because all of us in this community have shared concerns, we actually have shared strategies for best practices on how to interview virtually or how to be interviewed virtually. So it's really all about preparation. So we're going to talk about tips for before the interview as well as during the interview. So for applicants, I want you to think about preparing as if you're going to that institution in person. So get in that headspace that I'm actually flying to Boston. I'm going to feel that winter chill and I'm going to meet Dr. Hayes in person tomorrow. And so research the program just as if you were going to be there, just as if you were in that hotel room the night before. You do some soul searching and think about practicing responses to common questions that you might get. Reread your application. As you know, anything that you say there, even that one word in your hobby section, is fair game for interviewers to ask about. And we do love those hobbies. I will tell you, an informal analysis of our own applications at UCSF showed hiking was the single most common hobby of all applicants ever. Um, and dust off that old interview suit. We do still want to see professional attire for our interviews, and that means tops and bottoms. I know there's Zoom trends suggesting otherwise, but please wear your full interview suit. The second most important part of preparation is testing the tech. So thinking about, is my internet connection where I'm at stable? And if not, it, do I have a good backup option? Is there a socially distanced open library, coffee shop, friend's house, colleague's house, mentor's house that has a more reliable internet connection? Similarly, where are you gonna be seating? You're gonna spend a lot of time in 
and this chair. So get cozy with the chair that you're about to sit in to make sure that it's ergonomically okay. Make sure that the lighting is okay so that you're not in the dark, literally, when you're talking to your interviewer. Make sure that things visible in your background are, you know, aesthetically pleasing. There is this website called Rate My Skype Room or a Twitter account. I don't know if any of you have heard of that. It is a hilarious, somewhat parody account where they look at interviews done on TV and the media with celebrities, and they actually will rate people's backgrounds, and they'll say, you know, eight out of 10, please add a plant for good, you know, for good aesthetics. So you don't need to go overboard. I think the point is that the background should be neutral, not crowded. We don't want to see laundry. One of our faculty members actually got uh, dinged by Rate My Skype Room for having her bike and bike helmet visible in the background that was clearly leaning on the door. So, you know, just pay attention to what's in the background. And then software, of course, test that in advance if you can. Many of us are now well familiar with Zoom or sometimes your program might be used Google Hangouts, Microsoft, Skype. Some programs are doing a combo of telephone and virtual interviews. I haven't heard of any programs doing a TikTok interview yet. I hope it doesn't come to that. So, uh, <laughs> thanks, Nirav, for laughing. <laughs> so, tips for educators before the interview day. Um, you're going to see that a lot of it is the same because, like I said, we have shared concerns and shared strategies. So, prepare as if in person. Imagine you're in that headspace where tomorrow I have a day full of interviews. Read the applications thoroughly, every word, even the hobby section. If your program does standardize questions, as our program now does, because Dr. Geneva Tatum and others have published research showing that standardized questions actually decrease implicit bias, if you have standardized questions, review them in advance and think about what might be the most natural way for you to integrate those into the conversation. Do you have a little spiel before saying, oh, these are standard questions that we ask every applicant? And practice the wording so it doesn't feel awkward in the moment. Clear your schedule. Just because you're not physically going to meet with applicants one after the other, it's, it doesn't look good if the applicant, you know, is waiting for you and you're running behind or if you have to cut the interview short because you're triple booked with other research and other commitments. So just like you would for a real life interview day, make sure your schedule is really devoted to the interview day. And I think acknowledging the angst of applicants is helpful to just normalize that. Applicants can be really stressed out that this best format is new, it's virtual, it's uncertain. They may be worried about how they're being perceived, perceived. They may be worried, oh gosh, is my dog going to start barking in the background? Is my baby going to start crying? I, I am fearing for that literally as we speak. And so, you know, sometimes it can help put the applicants at ease by just saying, thank you so much for your flexibility. We're going all in virtual this year. I acknowledge this may not be what you're used to. And I really wish we could talk in person. I could shake your hand in person. And thank you for being here. I just want to put you at ease. I think that will really help the applicants. The second part, test the tech, is exactly what I had said for the interviewees. So similar things, make sure your background is appropriate, seating, lighting, and check out your software in advance. A brief word if you're a program administrator, program director, program coordinator, if you're doing things like breakout rooms, whiteboards, et cetera, some higher level Zoom functionality, make sure to do a dry run, have a backup plan, have a plan A, B, and a low tech plan. And now we're going to talk a little bit about what do you do when you get to the actual interview day. So tips for applicants during the interview. So what I did even before this talk, close your Outlook and silence your phone. We don't want to hear the dings of your new mail every single time. It's distracting to all. Body language is important. So trying to figure out where is your camera on your computer and looking at the camera. Some people's computers have very unfortunate camera placements where it is looking, you know, kind of up at you from under, leading to a very unflattering angle. So experiment with that in advance and try to place your camera in a good place. Make sure that your body language is engaged just as if you were talking in person. It's kind of awkward in the beginning, but you get used to it. Background noise, as I said, uh, if there is background noise, you know, I recognize that the challenges of childcare in this pandemic are disproportionately affecting some parents or elder care or pet care. So if you think there might be background noise, I think that if it comes up, you can just do a quick, um, quick move on and apology being like, oh, sorry about that. That's just my pet slash baby slash family member. 
And if you just quickly and professionally acknowledge it and move on, that's okay. Um, take your cues overall from virtual patient visits. Many of us have now had to learn abruptly, as Dr. Hayes and others were talking about, about virtual patient visits best practices and apply what you've learned in that setting to this setting. Lastly, for educators, I would say know the backup information of to call the applicant. Suppose for whatever reason, as was the case yesterday, actually at our institution, a large fiber cable was cut. And so all of UCSF's email was down for about an hour. So know, the, know your backup information of the low tech backup of how to call your applicant if your Zoom has, um, if your Zoom or whatever software you're using has died for whatever reason or if your internet is going out. Lastly, I wanted to spend a moment really talking about implicit bias or unconscious bias. Um, and so I wanted to acknowledge that many of the things that we think that virtual interviews will help with is actually that we think that it can actually attenuate a little bit the effects of implicit bias since everyone is on that level playing field. And we'll talk more about some strategies to address that. Uh, first, though, a quick word on what to do after the interview. Thanks or no thanks, to thank you note or not to thank you note. It really depends on the program's culture. At our institution, for example, we say that we abide by the AIM policy and we do not want any post-interview communication. We feel like it just leads to hurt feelings and um, reading between the lines and it doesn't need to lead to that uncertainty. So we all say up front on the interview day, you know, no need to send a thank you note. We are so grateful to have you here. You're not gonna get any weird messages from us. So just take the cue from the place you're interviewing at. I think after the interview, doing that self-reflection of, was this place, you know, what were the vibes that I got from this place? How did I feel? How did the interviewers make me feel? How did they connect with me? And, you know, when you are evaluating an applicant, I think it's really important to acknowledge your unconscious bias, be aware of it, and say, what might have made me feel that way? And we'll talk about some strategies to combat that. Putting that bias in mind, at the front of your mind, take notes early. So it's much easier to write down your impressions of the applicant or the program immediately after the virtual interview. So it's fresh in your mind, you can evaluate it later. And then revisit it later, a few days later, after a gut check to really reread what you said and say, hmm, why did I think that way? And really examine critically. So how do we combat implicit bias? As I mentioned, many programs are adopting strategies such as um, standardized questionnaires adopted by Dr. Geneva Tatum et al. to really think about how to make sure that every applicant is asked the same question to put everyone on the same playing field. Dr. Quinn Capers published this piece just this week in ATS Scholars talking about how clinicians and educators can mitigate implicit bias and he brings up a couple of really interesting strategies. One is called perspective taking where you really try to imagine what has that applicant been through you know, and try to empathize with the applicant, the struggles that they might have had in their life to see why they're, you know, why they might be acting in the way that they are, or why they're responding to a question in the way that they are. So take that perspective. The other thing to be aware of is affinity bias. And that's a natural bias that so it has a negative connotation, but Dr. Capers describes how you can use it to a positive connotation. So affinity bias is the classic, oh, you know, we're all in the same elite club together. And so I like people who are in the same elite club as I went to. You know, this person went to my medical school, therefore they're a good person. And so Dr. Caper says, use that affinity bias in another way, and that actually can mitigate your bias. For example, you're reading the hobby section and you say, that person likes hiking and piano. I love hiking and piano. And start up a conversation about hiking and piano. And Dr. Capers notes that research shows that if you proactively sort of look for affinities, then that actually kind of inures your mind to implicit bias. So it's not more in the traditional unconscious bias where research has shown, you know, um, in a male dominated environment, males are more likely to perceive other males as a better fit. Sim similarly, Caucasians are more likely to perceive Caucasians as a better fit, research shows, with interviewers. And so we have to be aware of those biases and actively combat them. And so this is a great article, especially for educators, to take some perspectives on how to concretely combat those biases. So thanks again for the opportunity to talk about this fun topic. And like I mentioned, there are some great resources out there, particularly by the APCCMPD, as well as the AAMC, talking about how to 
look at these tips and there's even checklists available on some of these websites about what to do. So thanks again, happy to take questions or wait till the end. Thank you, Dr. Santosh. And the spirit of that word cloud, I'll say shukriya because that's my uh, primary language. That's uh, right. That's right. So um, fantastic, fantastic, fantastic. Uh, the chat box is blowing up. I have a question for you. Uh, and please feel free to play along in the chat box. Uh, but what do you think about this virtual background? I love it. And actually, that's a really good point. Because some people have actually argued that your background can also be a source of implicit bias. That if you see, oh, they have those fancy bookshelves like the celebrities where they have head to toe bookshelves, that is really impressive. And that can really be, um, you know, you're judging someone basically based on their socioeconomic status or how their house looks. And so some people have actually advocated that we're gonna give you a UCSF inner day virtual background and send that to you and put that up behind you during our interview day so everyone is on the same playing field. I'm glad you brought that question up. Uh, David uh, out in the chat also shared uh, in continuation. And uh, actually while we're doing this, uh, Dr. Gendotra, if you wanna um, go ahead and screen, uh, share your screen, so we're ready for you. David shared that, you know, uh, have institutions thought about creating sort of these um, little areas where students or trainees can go and do their interviews. They're quiet, they have a standardized background. And I can see, like you said, this is part of the implicit bias, right? And I can see how that would be useful in mitigating that uh, during these times. I feel like that's an unfair burden on trainees, in my opinion, to be now concerned about what color their room is, right? And also, I lived in New York City, if you saw my apartment, my dog, me, uh, my books, and my, uh, you know, everything else was crammed in the 300 square foot of space. So I feel like that's unfair and I would rather have this background personally. But please, please feel free to engage in that robust discussion going on, Dr. Santosh. And thank you so much. That was awesome. Uh, Dr. Gendotra, um, all yours on uh, how this uh, pandemic is impacting our international medical graduates, which I'm sure you'll uh, tell us uh, how much of our a sort of workforce they constitute, which, um, spoiler alert, is quite a bit. Absolutely. Thanks, Viren and the ATS CCTF leadership for inviting me to be part of this session. Um, so we'll spend the next few minutes discussing COVID-related challenges faced by IMGs as they pursue medical education and training in the U.S. Um, so just a quick outline there. We'll start begin with that we'll begin with the fact that it's always been sort of difficult to differentiate oneself from other candidates as an IMG. Um, particularly, IMGs have relied upon scores on licensing exams to at least make it through the initial screening portions of um, applications for both residency and other things that IMGs are applying to. So uh, changes to the licensing, licensing exams present some challenges. Step one is now pass fail. Step two CS has been canceled. And so IMG students will have lost these opportunities as a first pass screening option um, that many program leadership faculty members will use to screen applications. Unfortunately, there have also been um, challenges that come from the cancellations or limitations in ability to perform rotations and clerkships in the US. So this relates to a loss of time to acclimatize to US healthcare systems and of course, the inability to obtain uh, letters of recommendation. As many of you will know, when we interview candidates, we're often looking for names that we know. And so this presents significant stressors for IMG applicants as they know that their, their letters may not be from names or institutions that we recognize. Um, furthermore, applicants are gonna be unable to showcase their skills prior to residency applications. And many applicants will rely on doing sort of sub eyes or clerkships at uh, centers that they may be considering applying to. For candidates, that also lets them see the culture of a place that they're applying to. And of course, all of this decreases access to mentors for IMG applicants. So Dr. Santos has already discussed a lot about virtual interviews, and so I won't belabor this, but virtual interviews do, of course, decrease the cost of travel and lodging for not just IMG applicants, but all applicants and may actually be very good for leveling the playing field, particularly in terms of cost, if applicants are traveling from international sites. Um, however, they do present some additional challenges. So internet access and ability to do 
video interviews may be different for international applicants compared to those that are those that are at least local on the on the same continent. Time zone differences, both for local and IMG applicants, should be considered. And then, of course, many of our interview questions may not always lend themselves well to their local practice. And I think we'll need to think about that as we look to interviewing uh, applicants in the coming year. So thirdly, um, this is an area that presents a huge area of stress for all non-US citizen IMGs. And, and many of you will have heard about the visa uncertainties. So currently, we know that there have been delays in visa processing for the upcoming year. Um, in particular, this, the effect of this on IMGs at tr transition positions is going to be um, particularly important as they await their visa approvals to start their next position. So for example, it may be that they're starting internship or fellowship or as a faculty member. And of course, the visa regulations are frequently changing. Furthermore, there is an impact on family members and dependents of those who hold a current visa and need it extended or renewed or transitioned to a different visa program. And then we have also heard about concerns about job loss and systems that suffered financially during the pandemic. Usually, IMGs serve underserved areas, and these are also some areas that have been particularly hard hit financially, and therefore, um, IMGs have been subjected to job losses. So as mentioned, this is an area of stress for all non-US citizen IMGs. And so if you know one, please make sure you check in. It, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the impact of IMGs on the US healthcare system and, and really why we need to pay attention to this. So there is a predicted shortfall of up to almost 122,000 physicians in the US by 2032. That's from the 2019 update by the AMA. Um, foreign trained physicians, as I mentioned, often work in underserved communities. And those are the communities that right now are particularly suffering during this pandemic and already were undersourced and understaffed. And that's even more so amplified if we aren't able to fill this predicted shortfall. Foreign trained physicians currently constitute a significant chunk of the US healthcare workforce, as Varen mentioned. So about 23.6% of overall physicians are currently foreign trained. Um, about 25% of those are of hospital-based physicians are foreign trained and about 22% of physicians currently in residency. Particularly related to the pandemic, and this is just a, a brief snapshot, 33% of actively practicing infectious disease physicians are actually foreign trained physicians and almost 41% of critical care physicians that are currently active are foreign trained physicians. So IMGs play a huge role in the US healthcare system. Um, and unfortunately, you know, if we don't pay attention to this as the challenges continue to increase for IMGs applying into the system, we'll have pretty significant shortfalls in the physician workforce in the US. Um, Lastly, I'd just like to mention that the regulatory limitations were brought to light as IMGs look to assist in areas of need during the pandemic. There are some states that were able to mitigate these, particularly New Jersey and New York, but most states in the U.S. were not able to have IMGs that currently live in the U.S. but don't necessarily have completed U.S. training um, from being able to actually help during times of need. Lastly, um, so addressing these challenges, how do we begin to pay attention to this and how do we begin to mitigate some of the impact? Well, I think IMG applicants really need to understand the changes and, and a few resources for doing that are the ECFMG, the AMA websites and the NRMP. And then we all need to seek mentors and seek to mentor, understanding that IMG applicants won't necessarily have had the opportunity to do, the, to do this in person as they uh, complete rotations in the US. Programs may also need to reevaluate their screening and application review processes. And we've already discussed really some virtual interview um, particulars by Dr. Santosh, but I think really thinking about time zones as we offer interview time slots to applicants, applicant access and applicant concerns. And so um, we should probably also think about informing not just IMG applicants, but all applicants about what to expect during their interview and some tips for virtual interviews would probably be much appreciated. And I think that's all for me. So I'm happy to take questions uh, and I look forward to a really rich discussion at the end of this as well. 
Amazing. So thank you, Dr. Gandotra, uh, uh, Dr. Shah, Dr. Um, Hayes, and Dr. Santosh. Uh, I appreciate everybody hanging back till uh, nine o'clock, well at finish time. Um, like I said, there was a pretty good back and forth going on in the chat box. So um, you're welcome to continue it while we're on. Uh, I just had a couple of questions from this chat box that have come up. So please, any of you feel free to uh, jump in. Um, when we talk about, uh, you know, implicit bias and conscious bias, we did share some tests you can take. Any other tips for educators to sort of prepare them in this digital interview world to sort of, you know, kind of look at their own biases and see what can be done to mitigate them or any other strategies? Yeah, I definitely believe that this is such an important value to embrace of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I think that fellowship leadership teams should really put it upon the fellowship leadership themselves to make sure that all interviewers are really trained in unconscious bias and because that can really change an applicant's life. And now more than ever, while we're doing virtual interviews, we really want to make sure that we're evaluating people fairly and equitably. That Dr. Quinn Capers article is a great place to start, freely available on ATS Scholar. I think going to the website, Project Implicit is another great resource. And I think that there are, you know, consulting companies that do offer unconscious bias or implicit bias trainings. I would urge you all to look at your parent medicine residency programs or other divisions. If, you're, if you feel like your faculty doesn't really have the capacity to do a training on this topic, look around. Does the internal medicine residency program or the Department of Surgery or do other people in your institution have this capacity where they could have a champion for diversity equity inclusion come and train your interviewers awesome and maybe this will be directed more towards dr hayes and dr gandotra but when you have this environment where now you have trainees that you know this could apply to people who train in the caribbean or in canada or india anybody uh our training outside the united states um, now you, they're not able to show an objective score in step one or they won't be able to soon. Um, step two, CS is suspended, so kind of difficult to gauge communication skills and they can't do electives in the US so they can't show that they understand the system. So would you be able to share, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, what would you now be looking at uh, for candidates from these institutions, which you know, understandably not everybody's gonna know every international institution. So. What as program directors, all of you, would, what would you be looking for? I think for us at BI, um, a lot of it is sort of like anything that we, any of us interview for, is a lot of word of mouth and, um, you know, who you know. And, you know, we call people when we see letters. Oh, we know this person or that person. Um, many people, I think now this year it'll be a little bit different, but many people have done research in the Boston area. So we are able to reach out to their research mentors. And for us, that sort of, that personal relationship matters a lot more than the tests and the scores. And that's something that we've done in the past and we'll continue to do. Although I do worry that some of those research sort of opportunities probably aren't there um, or people haven't had them to the level that they had before. So do I take that as an encouragement for all educators to, you know, not just quickly do a little skim, <laughs> but you know, if the letter says that, hey, reach out to me if you have questions to actually type that email or pick up that phone and say, you know what, I'm actually going to speak to you and get a little, little bit better understanding about the candidate. I, I definitely do that. And I encourage everyone to do that. Um, the way that we have it set up at BI is the um, each of the associate program directors have a list of schools that we review every year. So we get to know like the letter writers. And after doing it for a couple of years, you sort of can read between their lines, but you also start to have um, a relationship with them and you can you can call them up. One of my schools is UVM. So during application season, I like harass Garth Garrison all the time on like, tell me the real story about this student. Um, but that's something that we definitely do for um, IMGs and I think it's really important. Fantastic. Um, a quick question on how to balance standardized questions versus you know affinity questions. How, how do you find that? middle ground? Rough. That's a difficult question. That's almost a Gordon Ramsay question. 
Yeah, I had responded to this in the chat to say it out loud. I think that affinity questions are great because they build community, can help inure you from implicit bias, but you have to be careful that you don't ask any of the illegal questions, which are very biased. For example, asking people about marital status, family planning, et cetera. They are big no-nos. Uh, those are, and those are violations. If, if you get asked that as an applicant on the interview trail, you know, you should be sort of keeping that in mind for later. And after the, you can, there are confidential ways to give that feedback if somebody was asked that question. We want to know as program directors and program leaders if any of our faculty are asking those questions because that's not appropriate. So just, just to let everyone on the call know if that happens, you know, please do give that feedback. There's ways to give that feedback and still be protected. Um, so that's a word about the affinity group questions. Love the affinity group questions, but beware that you don't tread into even more biased land. And the standardized questions, you know, Dr. Tatum has published on this and she did a webinar on this through the ATS section on medical education earlier this year as well. And they, you know, they've been called behavioral interview questions or standardized interview questions. And the thought is that they're not gotcha type questions designated to stump you. It's not say, name five causes of hypoxemia with clear lungs, go. It's not like that. It's more trying to evaluate how would you do in a certain situation. So more like, tell us a time in your life when you've had to resolve conflict. You know, what did you do in that situation? Or tell us a time in your past when you showed leadership skills, things like that. So it's really getting to know an applicant because sometimes people may not bring up that type of stuff naturally in a conversation, especially if there's too many of those affinity questions. And so the standardized questions really allow everyone to be evaluated fairly with response to a standard set of questions. Perfect. And um, completely off book question, I'm gonna wrap up with this. Uh, in the meanwhile, let me share my screen. So please, uh, if you have any feedback or you want us to cover any other topics, please, please do tell me. I was actually gonna share this link uh, to this amazing webinar and I'll do that shortly. Uh, but the question for you is, uh, let's uh, really quickly pivot towards uh, fellows and residents who are now gonna be out there looking for jobs and with the you know, economic market being what it is, which I'm sure will bounce back. But right now, uh, how, how can educators, so let's say I wanna get Amish um, working with you, Dr. Hayes, right? because I'm always selfish like that. Uh, so what do you recommend educators do for their trainees? Do we, again, just reach out or do what can we also tell the trainees how to maximize their chances? Because they don't get to share their sort of presence with these future employers. They don't get to look around in the units. They don't get to show their sort of composure. Uh, backgrounds aside, what can be done? Yeah, and no in-person ATS, which was a big way that uh, people, you know, graduating fellows get to meet faculty. So that, that was a huge challenge. Um, I would put people in touch with um, faculty at, you know, areas that they're interested in, in going to. So there's a few people in New York that um, uh, someone from Hopkins connected me to that I've been talking to this past week and giving them a little bit of the lay of the land and trying to meet them a little bit and, and guide them. Uh, but it's definitely a, a problem and a challenge. Um, and I do worry about, I don't think any program right now knows what opportunity they're going to have for hiring um, for the next year. And I think that's a big challenge. I think everything is going to be a little bit more delayed than it usually is. And, and I worry about that. But I think like for us, like when I chatted with these people from New York, you know, letting my division chief know, hey, I talked to these couple great candidates, like can you and I chat about them again, maybe in October, November, or like, when would be good for you? When do you think we'll have a sense of the budget, et cetera? And just sort of being an advocate um, for them to the division chief and to the department chair who are doing the hiring. Any other thoughts on that matter, Dr. Gindotra, Dr. Santos, before we close out for the day? I think the advocating for applicants is huge and certainly um, referring them to people that you may know elsewhere, friends of yours may know elsewhere, because that's really one of the only ways that people will have now to, to sort of reach out to places of interest. Um, I think sending sort of emails of interest to division chiefs that are hiring or to people that you may know through ATS or through other programs um, is probably worth doing as well. I think for the IMG applicants, it becomes even more important just because the visa applications have to happen so early in time and with the uncertainty at institutions about hiring, those applicants may be forced to look 
really at non-academic places that are able to do the visa application sooner. So if you certainly are mentoring IMG applicants, remembering that their visa applications often need to happen nearly a year in advance and really working with them to sort those things out is incredibly important. It was challenging enough pre-COVID, and I can imagine that it's going to be even more challenging in the post-COVID era. Yeah, I just wanted to say that this is the time to lean on your mentors and sponsors, and sponsors are going to have to do a little bit more heavy lifting this year in making those introductions and connections, and that's what sponsors are happy to do. So even though it may feel unnatural to toot your own horn, do send out your CV and updates to your mentors and sponsors and make them help you make those connections. That is what we're all here for. So I love this idea about holding our mentors and sponsors accountable. I know that as friends, I've leaned on the three of you as recently as last week. So I understand the importance of that. But Amish, really, and this time we are going to close that. I'm not just trying to uh, prolong this. But, you know, in the spirit of openness, Amish, you know, this is about trainees. This is about our fellows. We spend so much time with you guys, and this is all about you. You have three fantastic educators, not only on screen, and I know there's 80 or more listening to you. What as a trainee do you need from us at this time? Because I know you're approaching the job search. What, what would make it easier for you? Um, I, think the, I think the mentorship itself is, I think, probably the most important thing. And having, having those mentors during my first couple of years of fellowship and obviously going into my last year of fellowship, um, but having that access and understanding how the system actually works in the manner of whether it be through ATS and many of these other organizations, but having those connections and using those, I think is um, supremely important And knowing is it appropriate to ask for that help. I think a lot of people are scared to ask for that help, which is one of the, uh, I think, challenges, especially when I'm started the, the job search, it's a little early, but even looking into that. Like it's scary to text a mentor or an attending, hey, I've worked with you a lot. Do you mind writing me a letter to this place? And, and just taking that step has been uh, definitely a challenge. So knowing that people are there for you is definitely uh, something that um, I think would make it a lot easier for a lot of applicants to make it that approachable to say, hey, I'm thinking about looking here. Do you mind helping me out in any way? Do you know anyone there? You know, that, that would be helpful. Fantastic. So what I'm getting from you guys is clearly communication as usual is key. So from for mentors, guys, please take a second for your trainees. These are hard times for everybody. So please take a second and ask them, hey, what can we do to help you? Offer up that help ahead of time. Don't wait for them to ask you. And for mentees and trainees, please, please, please don't think twice. If you don't ask, sometimes we don't know. So let's, I, I think what I'm hearing from all of us is we all want to help. So just, just let's talk to each other. You all know my email. Uh, you all know the QR code. Uh, you know we'll be back here next week with a fantastic session. Uh, so uh, please join us next week. And thanks for staying this long. And thank you, all four of you, for doing this. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thanks so much. Thank you all.